We all know the iconic Rumble in the Jungle fight between Ali and Foreman, but few know when Foreman schooled Muhammad Ali in front of his eyes and also in front of over 1 million people on live TV. Forget what you think you know about the Rumble in the Jungle. While the 1974 clash between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman cemented itself in boxing lore, there's a story before the iconic rope-a-dope, before the eighth round knockout. It's a story etched not just in punches, but in clashing ideologies, global spectacle, and the underdog's unwavering defiance. Let's rewind the clock to a time when the boxing world was on the edge of its seat, eagerly anticipating the clash of two titans, Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. The stage was set for a showdown that would etch its name in the annals of sporting history. But the precursor to their iconic rumble in the jungle had its own intense moments. It's befitting that I go out of boxing like I came in, meeting a big, strong bully that knocks everybody out, that everybody's afraid of. England can't produce nothing to beat George Fullman. Africa can't produce nothing to beat George Fullman. Japan, China, no country but old Muhammad Ali. Before the iconic rumble in the jungle, the paths of Muhammad Ali and George Foreman intersected in a series of fights that set the stage for one of the most legendary encounters in boxing history. The journey begins with Ali's hiatus from the sport after being stripped of his title due to his refusal to be drafted into the Vietnam War. In his absence, Foreman rose through the ranks, bulldozing opponents with brutal efficiency. One significant milestone was Foreman's showdown with Joe Frazier in 1973, the Sunshine Showdown. Foreman's devastating display, knocking Frazier down six times in the first two rounds, sent shockwaves through the boxing world. Ali, who had previously faced Frazier in the fight of the century, was now witnessing Foreman's dominance firsthand. And then we finally had Rumble in the Jungle Fight, where Foreman lost to Ali come home and I was angry for a long time. I figured I'd been betrayed by my managers. I'd been given things in my water, the ropes were loose. I had all the kind of excuses that filled me with hatred and revenge. I felt like I'd lost everything, not just the championship of the world, but I'd lost myself as a man. Foreman attempted a comeback, but that ended. The rumble in the jungle wasn't just a fight for George Foreman. It was a seismic shift in his world. Here was this force of nature, once seen as invincible, now standing in the ring with the taste of unexpected defeat lingering in his mouth. Muhammad Ali, the master tactician, had outwitted him, leaving Foreman in a state of disbelief, questioning everything he thought he knew about himself and the sport. Imagine George Foreman, not just as a boxer, but as a man fueled by a whirlwind of emotions, anger, and an insatiable hunger for revenge. The rumble in the jungle wasn't just a loss for him. It was a gut punch, a moment that shook the core of who he was. So, armed with this mix of raw feelings, Foreman made a decision. He wouldn't let that one defeat define him. You know, I can remember, and it never goes to this day, it's never gone out of my mind. I hit him so hard one time, right about the neck. And I heard him say, Ugh. and I've never forgotten that. He was trying to win a boxing match. Mm -hmm. I was trying to kill that guy. Mm. And I wanted a second chance. To and that's why Foreman decided to give a lesson to Ali that he won't ever forget. Or at least that was what the Foreman thought in his mind. Because what happened next was just one of the worst pages of modern boxing history. The year was 1975. Muhammad Ali had just dethroned the seemingly invincible George Foreman in the rumble in the jungle, leaving the boxing world buzzing. But instead of sulking, Foreman decided to put on a show unlike any other, a five-fight exhibition dubbed Foreman vs. Five. As the surreal spectacle unfolded, George Foreman's attempt to regain public interest and showcase his power took on a life of its own, veering into the realms of both entertainment and desperation. The hulking figure that was Foreman, tipping the scales at 232 pounds, found himself standing across the ring not from a single formidable adversary, but from a series of significantly weaker opponents, each adding a layer of absurdity to the unfolding drama. Foreman, ever the showman, embraced the theatrics with unbridled enthusiasm. The hoisting of steers for photo ops, the opponents dubbed the Five Dreamers, and the involvement of Marvin Gaye as the supposed mastermind behind this bizarre five-fight idea. It was all a calculated attempt to create a spectacle, 
However, beneath the bravado, a subtle but crucial change was taking place. Foreman had parted ways with his longtime trainer, Dick Sadler, opting for a new approach that leaned heavily on Flash, but seemed to lack the substance that had defined his earlier career. The Foreman thing, as some skeptics labeled it, quickly spiraled into a surreal circus. Muhammad Ali, an expert in psychological warfare, played his part from ringside, taunting Foreman and drawing a frustrated chair toss in response. Each fight, initially intended to showcase Foreman's power, morphed into a descent into madness. Alonzo Johnson, dispatched in two rounds, only fueled the chants of Ali, Ali from the crowd, intensifying the distractions for the already volatile Foreman. The frustration that simmered beneath the surface soon boiled over. Bouts turned into chaotic brawls, with opponents like Terry Daniels, clearly outmatched, refusing to go down easily. Near brawls erupted between teams, and even Foreman's own corner experienced the wrath of his inexplicable rage. The exhibition, designed for triumph, began to unravel, laying bare a vulnerability to distractions and questionable decision-making that would, unfortunately, play a role in his upcoming rematch with Ali. The circus pressed on. Charlie Polite, blowing kisses before hitting the canvas without a punch thrown, added another layer to the absurdity. Even the final opponent, Boone Kirkman managed to go the distance despite an early knockdown. The crowd, initially enticed by the spectacle, grew restless, their boos echoing in the half-filled arena. As the event concluded, it became evident that Foreman's attempt to reignite his career had taken an unexpected turn, setting the stage for a dramatic chapter in the ongoing saga of his rivalry with Muhammad Ali. The anticipated epic return of George Foreman turned into an unexpected psychological horror show, unveiling the harsh reality that Foreman had made little progress in recovering from his devastating loss to Muhammad Ali. The exhibition, designed to be a triumphant comeback, instead showcased a Foreman who, for the entire spectacle, embodied an unlikable and troubled persona, a far cry from the formidable figure fans once admired. In a bizarre turn of events, Foreman's aggression extended beyond the five fighters in the ring. He punched an opposing cornerman, revealing a disturbing lack of control. Even more shocking was his assault on a couple of his own cornermen, including his own cousin. The display of erratic behavior painted a troubling picture of Foreman's mental state, laying bare the toll Ali's mind games had taken on him. The five-fight frenzy wasn't just a spectacle gone wrong, it was a window into the psyche of a fighter grappling with demons both internal and external. While George Foreman never explicitly labeled the aftermath as psychological problems, his actions and reflections paint a picture of a man battling more than just his opponents in the ring. Ali, perched ringside like a mocking jester, capitalized on Foreman's vulnerability. Taunts echoed, laughter rang, and Foreman, once an icon of dominance, found himself entangled in a web of frustration and humiliation. The blows he landed on his outmatched opponents seemed mere shadows compared to the psychological beating he endured. Initially, pride masked the cracks. Foreman defended his actions, clinging to the narrative of a triumphant showcase. Yet the truth couldn't be hidden forever. The sparse crowd, the scathing press, and even Foreman's own acknowledgement, years later, stupid, he conceded, revealed the exhibition as a self-inflicted wound. Beyond the immediate sting, the event had lasting consequences. The door to an Ali rematch slammed shut after Foreman's surprise loss to Jimmy Young. This missed opportunity, coupled with the public ridicule, could have easily fueled a spiral of anger and disappointment. And the next decision Foreman took completely changed his life and boxing history. The echoes of the five-fight frenzy still reverberated in 1977 when George Foreman, at the seemingly young age of 28, made a decision that sent shockwaves through the boxing world. He was retiring. While this bizarre exhibition undoubtedly cast a long shadow, Foreman's departure from the ring wasn't a singular act of despair. It was a culmination of various forces, both internal and external, that pushed him towards a new path. Certainly, the five-fight frenzy wouldn't have been a pleasant memory. Public ridicule, a missed Ali rematch, and potential financial losses could have easily soured him on the sport he once dominated. The exhibition might have been a stark reminder of the changing landscape of professional boxing, a world increasingly driven by spectacle and money, which may have clashed with Foreman's evolving values. Retirement wasn't a sudden surrender, but a carefully considered move. It wasn't the end, but a new beginning. The man who hung up his gloves in 1977 wasn't the same one who stepped into the ring years earlier. 
He was a man seeking solace in faith, purpose in service, and perhaps a quiet escape from the pressures that had become overwhelming. I don't want your money, I want you. So I, as they laid on the table, I'm, I'm coming back into my body, and I told one, my doctor, there was eight men in the room, to move his hand because there's the thorns are making him bleed. And blood started running down my face. And I told the other ones to move their hand because the blood on, my, on his hands was making, you know, his bleeding on his hand, and on my feet there was blood. All the places where Jesus had I died, and I never believed in Jesus. The roar of the crowd, the sting of gloves, the flash of lights, these were the elements that once defined George Foreman, the formidable boxer who reigned supreme in the ring. But beneath the surface of this seemingly invincible champion, a different battle raged, a fight for meaning, purpose, and redemption. And it was on this quieter battlefield that the most transformative victory of his life would be won. Foreman's spiritual journey, though its exact beginnings remain veiled in time, unfolded sometime in the late 1970s. It wasn't a casual switch, but a seismic shift that shook the very core of his being. The man who once embodied raw power and aggression found himself drawn to the solace and guidance of faith. This wasn't simply a change of belief. It was a metamorphosis, a shedding of the old skin, and an embrace of a new identity. In fact, also, when he returned to the ring, his style was completely different, like his person. Real estate and what I had in the bank, and I saw it all like a big joke. I don't know if you stick a match to a piece of paper. For a moment, it stands up after it's burned, and then you touch it and crumble. I saw the whole world crumble behind me, and all I had was nothing. I had to leave all of that in the world, and I couldn't even tell my mother, bye, I was dead. The turbulent aftermath of the infamous five-fight frenzy might have served as a catalyst for this transformation. Disillusioned with the boxing world and burdened by the event's shadow, Foreman sought refuge in the quiet strength of faith. His conversion wasn't an escape, but a path towards redemption, a chance to reconcile his past and forge a new purpose. But Foreman's newfound faith wasn't meant to reside within the confines of his own heart. In 1978, he took the bold step of becoming an ordained minister, planting the seeds of his church in Houston. Stepping from the boxing ring to the pulpit symbolized a complete transformation, a conscious choice to serve others and share the peace he had found. His ministry, however, wasn't confined to sermons and Sunday services. Foreman actively engaged with youth programs, offering guidance and mentorship, showcasing his commitment to making a positive impact beyond the church walls. From prison outreach programs to disaster relief efforts, he translated his faith into action becoming a living testament to the message of compassion and service. Test on me for about two or three days, and nothing was wrong with me. But I saw the glory of God. I saw it. Let me tell you that Jesus is alive. That's a living God, and I didn't even know it. I was wondering about it, but now I'm not wondering. I know. And I thank God because there's a lot of people who think for sure, and maybe and maybe not, but I know. God, I don't know, for some reason, touched me an old sinner. That's another but he isn't the only one who faced a real life changing due to his faith. In fact, even the legendary heavyweight boxer Muhammad Ali completely changed his life after his embrace of the Nation of Islam. In 1964, shortly after defeating Sonny Liston to become the world heavyweight champion, Ali publicly announced his affiliation with the Nation of Islam and his name changed from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. The Nation of Islam, led by Elia Muhammad, advocated for the empowerment of African Americans and promoted a distinct interpretation of Islam. Ali's conversion to Islam was not just a change in religious affiliation. It became a central part of his identity. He often spoke about the Nation of Islam's teachings, including self-pride, racial justice, and opposition to the Vietnam War. Ali's newfound faith influenced not only his personal life, but also his professional career and public image. As a result of his refusal to be drafted into the military during the Vietnam War, citing religious reasons and his newfound convictions, Ali faced significant legal challenges. He was stripped of his boxing titles, barred from competing, and faced public backlash. However, Ali stood firm in his beliefs, maintaining that his faith prohibited him from participating in a war he viewed as unjust. Ali's perseverance through these challenges and his commitment to his faith 
contributed to a broader narrative of resilience and principle. Over time, public opinion shifted, and in 1971, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned his conviction. Ali returned to the boxing ring and continued to achieve success, eventually regaining his heavyweight titles against the poor foreman. Wouldn't you like to get back in the ring with Muhammad Ali again? And your answer was, mm, I'd like to get in church with him. <laughs> <laughs> While Ali and Foreman took different paths in their religious journeys, both experienced significant life changes influenced by their faith. Ali's commitment to Islam became a symbol of usual and political resistance, challenging societal norms. While Foreman's embrace of Christianity provided him with a personal transformation that revitalized his boxing career and contributed to a positive impact beyond the sport. The parallels in their stories showcase the diverse ways in which faith can shape individuals' lives instigating resilience, personal growth, and new beginnings. Everything seems good now, right? But Foreman suddenly knew that one of his closest friends, who was the manager of his finance, burned all the money Foreman earned throughout his entire career, and now Foreman is forced to return to the ring to make a living. The image of George Foreman thundering back into the ring at 38 to reclaim the heavyweight crown remains etched in boxing history. But the narrative of his comeback often simplifies the journey, painting it solely as a testament to faith and resilience. While these played crucial roles, a deeper look reveals a more nuanced story, where financial pressures intertwined with his spiritual calling and competitive spirit, pushing him back into the spotlight. Financial concerns undoubtedly influenced Foreman's decision. The life of a preacher wasn't always financially secure, and the need to provide for his family loomed large. But beneath the practicalities, the embers of the competitive spirit still flickered. Boxing wasn't just a career, it was a part of him, and the chance to reclaim his glory and silence his doubters proved irresistible. However, Foreman wasn't the same fighter who reigned supreme in his youth. Faith had woven itself into the fabric of his being. Gone was the reckless aggression, replaced by a calculated discipline born from countless hours of training and introspection. He moved with the grace of a man who understood the dance of boxing, not just the brawl. This wasn't just a physical change, it was a reflection of a transformed mind. The fiery temper had cooled, replaced by a newfound respect for his opponents. Humility, instilled by his faith, allowed him to savor the journey, not just fixate on victory. He understood that winning and losing were part of the tapestry, and his purpose extended beyond the ropes. Yet the fire still burned. The faith that fueled his discipline also fueled his determination. He trained with the fervor of a man on a mission, not just to win a title, but to prove something to himself. That redemption was possible, both in the ring and beyond. His comeback wasn't without its stumbles, Defeats reminded him of his limitations, forcing him to rely on the resilience his faith had nurtured. But in 1994, at the age of 45, defying all odds, George Foreman reclaimed his heavyweight title. It was a victory that transcended the sport, a testament to the transformative power of faith and the unyielding human spirit. So, to say Foreman's return was solely driven by faith would be an oversimplification, it was a tapestry woven with financial need, competitive fire, and the indelible mark of his spiritual journey. But his faith did more than guide him back. It shaped him into a different fighter, a different man, one who found glory not just in victory, but in the fight itself. He became a living embodiment of the verse. For I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 proving that even the most formidable champion can find strength and purpose in something bigger than themselves. I found him. He became my most beloved friend ever. And I miss him to this day because that was the gift of boxing Muhammad Ali and our friendship. That was my gift. Another important thing Foreman said that completely changed his life was, hit the subscribe and the like button if you want to have your best life and finally have God in your life. Thank you for watching this video. Who is better, Foreman or Ali?